Good afternoon. Welcome everyone to the Biotechnical Advocacy Lab. So glad to have you all here today. Uh, for today's webinar, we are going to focus on communicating to the grassroots. So what we're going to do is we're going to go over a toolkit of resources and scenarios to equip your participants uh, to ed educate, motivate, and activate uh, their respective congressional members. I know many of us are going to be doing introductory meetings in November um, in this virtual environment. So I think these tips will be really helpful um, as the next few weeks approach. So today, we will hear from Matthew Zablud, who is a founding partner at the Beekeeper Group. Uh, he loves devising creative and cost-effective strategies to help boost stakeholder recruitment and empower supporters to become high-quality advocacy champions. Um, I want to encourage everyone today, if you have questions uh, while he's presenting, please put it in the chat box. Um, and we'll stop throughout and read the questions as we go. So uh, please uh, don't be shy, submit your questions and we will address them. But I will turn it over to you, Matthew, and look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for spending some time here. We're gonna do a pretty tight hour, uh, but I'm gonna try and address questions as they come in uh, through Ashley and Amanda uh, moderating. Uh, so feel free to interrupt. I kind of like that format anyway. Uh, it's, it's always difficult doing these webinars where I don't get any feedback. So if you're enjoying something or uh, you hate something or uh, you just like an idea or you've done something similar in your program, please add that to the chat as well. Uh, uh, only the questions will get asked to me, but if you've got a comment or some thought that that would be really helpful as well. Uh, let's have a look at what we're going to actually talk about today. And I'm going to keep this sort of a little bit more above basics level. I'm, I've sort of been told that all of you are running programs and you, you're familiar with advocates and advocacy and all that. So I'm going to kind of keep the basics to, to the back. Uh, if I get a little too into the weeds, again, you can let me know in the questions and just say, could you explain something? Very happy to do that. Um, a little bit more about myself. So I'm a partner at Beekeeper, I have been for 10 years. I was a partner at a previous firm called Edfero Group, which you guys may be familiar with uh, for five years before that. Uh, I'm a recovering lawyer, uh, but I haven't practiced in now 19 years, which is kind of crazy. Uh, and I worked uh, on the e-campaign of the Bush-Cheney uh, 2004 presidential election campaign and also for the RNC in Florida. So I know what that feeling is right now. I was doing um, election poll watching and things like that. Uh, so it's sort of very weird to see it all coming back around again as it does. Uh, today, we're going to go through the components of a grassroots program. We're going to look at some high level outreach strategies, uh, developing an advocacy strategy, uh, digitizing grassroots and a bit of a toolkit there. And then I know this is very relevant. Uh, we're going to look at some very specific virtual tactics. Uh, these are tactics from an article I wrote very early on in uh, the COVID crisis. Uh, I've got some stuff to update on that. Uh, and then we're going to look at the new Congress, and I'm going to make sure to touch on uh, some ideas that we're seeing from some other organizations about how to introduce yourself to the new Congress, uh, especially given your industry, I think uh, you may be pretty interesting uh, to the new Congress. Uh, we do a lot of work with um, the Society for Microbiology uh, and also the National Alliance on Mental Illness, both groups that are very relevant right now. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about some of the ideas that they're using uh, to potentially introduce themselves to the new Congress. But I'm gonna start with some questions. And these aren't necessarily questions you need to answer. I'm gonna kind of, this is the basics of what we all know, right? What is grassroots organizing? It's building a network, volunteers and advocates to advocate, to take action at state or, you know, state, country, count, county, all of that kind of stuff, right? Federal level is what we're gonna focus on today. This is the stuff you know. But these are the kind of elements we're gonna talk about. Organizing, mobilizing, engaging, but these are the questions. And they're really the questions that, they might seem a little basic. It's a little bit like the who, what, where, when, why and storytelling, but they're sometimes questions that we as practitioners lose sight of because we've been doing this so long and we're so used to, to uh, thinking about our own programs that I'd like you to just think about. And I wanna start off this presentation with you thinking through these questions. 
Uh, if it's a question you haven't asked of your own program in a while, uh, maybe this is a good opportunity to take some notes. Um, but you know, who is the audience? Where is the audience? How do you monitor the audience? That's one that's very, very often missed. Um, what stories do the audience have to share? You'll hear a lot about storytelling and story collection as we go through this presentation. Uh, stories have become a very, very important part of a high level advocacy strategy. Uh, and they are something that we can do virtually. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about some examples. Uh, Beekeeper has been working with the National Restaurant Association, the Distilled Spirits Council and others uh, during this crisis. Uh, and you can imagine some of the stories that we've been able to collect and the impact that they've had. Um, what information does the audience still need? That's another really good question that often gets mi missed. And then the fundamental question that we all think we know where we all think we're asking, but we're often not, uh, which is what do we want our advocates to do? Um, let's talk about engaging for a bit. Knowing the audience and what made it motivates them, know what the audience is interested in and talking about and provide constant and meaningful ways for them to engage. And sometimes we forget that part of engagement. We often think about what we want the advocates to do or what we think the ad we want the advocates to do, but we don't always think about how to create a benefit for them, how to make it interesting, or perhaps even why they are engaging. Um, you know, uh, numerous surveys of uh, advocate audiences and members of different organizations and patient action groups talk about the reason why these people get involved or why they see value from that organization. And one of the key and most consistent reasons is that they want to engage on public policy issues. They want to reach out to their members of Congress and other policymakers, and they want to be heard. So again, just something to really think about and, and keep in part of your process. So the big questions, how do you communicate with your network currently? And hopefully the question I will help you answer as we go through this presentation, how can that be enhanced updated or streamlined? And I promise I will help answer these questions. I'm not just gonna throw questions at you the whole time. So how do you activate your network? Let's start getting into some of the tactical elements. So we've got educational resources, uh, and that can be anything from basic white papers or website information to some really well-designed uh, brochures, one pages, animations. I'm gonna to talk to you about some of those. Advocacy calls to action story collection and there's some really great ways to collect stories right now uh, i talk i'll talk about this a little later on in the virtual tactics section of this presentation but one of the things that was always a huge challenge for advocacy organizations was getting people to send in videos or getting your advocates to be comfortable on video well guess what we've just had six months of intense training on uh, video and audio standards and the way to present well and as some people still haven't learned all the lessons yet, but uh, it means that we have the ability to collect these stories, which we know are extremely valuable. Uh, advocacy trainings, I believe we're doing one right now, uh, but there are lots of different versions. Uh, there's lots of ways that this can be achieved, certification programs, all of that kind of stuff is very popular right now. Again, I'll talk about that a little later on. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning, this is key. Uh, and particularly at the higher levels and something I want to talk to you a little bit about. Uh, volunteer leadership opportunities and then obviously your general recruitment efforts, uh, which I'm not going to get too involved here other than to show you some tactics and ways that we can recruit through paid and earned activities. All right, high level outreach. So the three-legged stool of government affairs, uh, it's a pretty short stool, so maybe we need a bigger stool for next time. But uh, as a general rule, um, these three legs form the, the basics of most government affairs programs. Now, not everybody's going to have a PAC and not everybody will do lobbying or perhaps not everybody will do grassroots. You're probably doing at least one of them or you wouldn't be on this session. But when you have those three elements combined, uh, you have a pretty robust program. And at this higher level that I want to talk about today, I'm going to make special reference to that. But again, if you don't have PAC or you don't have one of the other elements in your stool, uh, just know that there's still lots of options uh, to, to play with and to engage uh, with members of Congress and also your advocates. So let's talk about some of the longer term 
higher level advocacy elements that, that we start to see. Paid recruitment, promotion and acquisition. Uh, these may sound like a dirty word for some groups, particularly if there isn't a huge amount of money. And there are ways to do that recruitment in an earned way. And uh, you'll notice I refer to things as paid and earned. Uh, earned still takes a lot of time. You might not be putting uh, advertising dollars out there to get it done, but you're, you're paying people probably like yourselves uh, to make that happen. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about campaign branding, visuals, that kind of thing. Uh, it's something that we lose sight of sometimes, uh, and it's extremely helpful for empowering advocates. Uh, it's also really helpful for the people that they're talking to. So we'll talk to you about that too. Um, Grasstops grass recruitment and development, issue-based coalition building, which I know many of you are involved in. Uh, media relations training, you wouldn't always think of this as a particularly high level or as a activity that you would be uh, engaging for your advocates, uh, but they want it. Uh, it's really popular when we offer that as a training option, uh, and you would be surprised at the amount of additional coverage you can get, particularly at the state and local level with the right kinds of advocates. Uh, story collection, banking, vetting, publishing. Uh, again, I, I can't emphasize enough, now is the time to do this. Uh, it may, we may never get this time again, I hope we never get this time again, but, but really trying to collect these stories now when people are used to video. A couple of quick tips on that before I go on. Uh, try and get people to capture on an uh, iPhone or a, or a similar smartphone device rather than on Zoom. If you have to do Zoom, it's fine. It's a little more natural when it's caught on iPhone and the audio tends to be better. Um, usually you can have them in a better background or setting than you know whatever's going on behind me and me sort of looking into, into a laptop. Um, and ask them to send you a couple of different versions of things. Uh, it doesn't always work out the first time. I prefer it when it's a horizontal uh, or a landscape view, but if, it, if they don't send it to you that way, it's still very easy to edit together. Uh, and also don't think about um, the story collection as having to get a final edited piece. You know, it's very easy once you've got this footage to be able to edit it, to mix in B-roll, to do other things. I'll talk about that as well. Um, so get the, get the stories in and let the editing team and the videographer figure out how to make it all work rather than trying to have it perfect from the get-go from the individual that you're getting. Uh, champion building, and I'm going to show you a depth metrics model uh, that we've implemented for clients like Microsoft and others uh, that I think you might find interesting. Uh, and then uh, a little bit on just some district level champions networks, uh, programs the US Chamber and the Alzheimer's Association have been very successful at. Uh, and that really is about creating a network, not just key contacts program, but actually uh, small groups of people. Again, I'll talk to you about some versions of that. So that's great in terms of the things that you can build into your program, hopefully over the next few years. Uh, it's not particularly helpful uh, if you wanna do something now. So uh, we figured we'd tell you about some ideas that you can do right now. Letter desking. Some of you are gonna be very familiar with letter desking. In short, it is about finding stakeholders and then either um, you call them up and do an interview, maybe like 15 minutes, uh, or you can hire someone to do that. There's plenty of groups that do it. Uh, you call them up, you do an interview, you then write a letter for them using your talking points, you know, using your key ask. You send that letter back to them and ask them to on send it to uh, the lawmakers. Highly powerful, highly customized. Uh, it can be done pretty quickly once you get good at it. You know, you could probably get a letter produced in an hour. So that's your interview, writing the letter, sending it back, even with edits. Um, that sounds like a lot of time, but you know, 20 to 50 letters uh, could make a really big difference in the right type of setting. So it's something you should definitely consider. Patch through calling, you all know, uh, it's a little different right now. Um, and is one thing if the, if the crisis continues um, in, in through the new Congress substantially, I'm not sure I'm gonna recommend patch through calling. Um, there's just not as many people in those offices, uh, but there are other things you can do. Ironically, a return to email and a return to some of those form emails, as much as I, I don't always recommend form emails, we're noticing in this time that it's having an impact uh, and it may just be the way the offices are working right now, so something to think about. Um, 
a paid fly-in. Uh, that's where you actually would cover the costs of the people coming in uh, or a virtual fly-in. Again, I'll talk to you about that, about that later. Uh, a paid media relations effort like a satellite tour. Uh, if you're not familiar with the satellite tour, it's effectively a setup for key surrogates uh, and they go around and talk radio and different publications. Um, it's uh, an interesting process. We'd be happy to fill in more information if that's something you're interested in. Um, homepage takeovers, and this is for online advertising, impression saturation, that's stuff that can be done on 48 hours notice, although I will note there are some pretty strict rules coming in place over the next few weeks. Uh, so if you're planning to do something there, um, you know, you need to, to be aware of what that is. But when we come back in and we have the new Congress, uh, that will open up, hopefully. And then C-suite outreach. Um, we ran a program for the Business Roundtable called the Sustainability Challenge. And in this program, um, CEOs would call each other out, much like on the Ice Bucket Challenge. Uh, they'd call each other out to you know, support sustainability and say what they were doing in their organization. Uh, it may just be a matter of going and trying to get letters from uh, C-suite or other key leaders within a community. Uh, but those are the things that you can do at a higher level right now. The other elements that we talked about before are things that you need to add into your program. All right, taking it to the next level. So uh, we don't really have a poll, but well, this is something you can just think of. And, and if you get it right, you can have sort of bragging rights to yourself. But according to the Congressional Management Foundation, which of these is most impactful in changing the mind of a member of Congress who has not arrived at a firm decision on an issue? So we've got individualized email, individualized postal letter, an editorial in a local newspaper, comments in a town hall meeting, phone calls to the Washington office, letter to the editor that mentions member of Congress by name, visit from a lobbyist, form email message from constituents, in-person visit from constituents and contact from constituents reps. Now, first of all, uh, if you're not doing at least some of these, uh, take a photo of the screen because this is a pretty good list that the Congressional Management Foundation came up with. I'm going to give you a second or two here. Think about which of these is the most impactful. And I'm going to show you the results. So which of these is the most impactful? According to the Congressional Management Foundation, who have done a number of interviews over the years, uh, in-person issue visits from constituents. Now, that's great. Thank you, Matthew, for telling us the one thing that we can't do right now uh, is the most influential, and that is true, and I feel bad. But we can in a virtual way. I will go into that in more depth uh, later on. Um, but we are hearing from particularly um, dist in-district staff that the virtual meetings not only are working, but they are likely to be here to stay uh, even after we get through this crisis uh, for two reasons. One, uh, it does cut down on the travel time for the constituents to be able to have the kind of meeting that they want to have. And two, and perhaps the more important reason, uh, it means that the office can schedule more meetings with the member or key staff members uh, with constituents. So I think the virtual option will be available, which is very, very good. If you look down the rest of this list, and again, take a photo, uh, this session is being recorded and I know uh, will be available to you, but uh, again, just to give you a sense of, of where all of this loops in, you'll notice that uh, there isn't much here on social media. I suspect that is more because um, this was a little bit of an older survey. Uh, I think in the newer surveys, you will see social media mentions in particular at mentions of a member of Congress starting to move higher and higher up. Uh, anything that is calling out a member of Congress or anything that is personalized tends to go higher in these results. Okay, developing an advocacy strategy. So we're going to talk a little bit about building a tool chest. Uh, the one problem when you're talking about a strategy is we often get talking about tactics and assets, which is not the end of the world. We're going to do that again here. Uh, and we've kind of talked through some of the overarching strategic elements and some of the asks that we want to deliver. Right now, we're going to talk a little bit about the assets and we'll show you some examples. But at the beginning point of all of this is our content production, infographics, social graphics, one pages, print materials. Here's some examples. We've got a cute little Halloween one that we did for Lily. There's a nice seafood one, stuff for the auto industry. Uh, you can think outside the box. The more visual, the better. 
uh, you would be surprised how many words of content, how many you know, white page report pages went into the global automakers infographic uh, to explain the same content. So I really encourage you to think about this. Uh, again, it's information to empower your advocates, but it's also information that they can share. And when you have that dual benefit, it's worth the investment. Uh, we can look at some visual social media content. You'll notice some of this is old, actually. This is this was about the Obama White House. Uh, it is a little ironic that back then we were making fun of uh, President Obama uh, uh, playing too many rounds of golf. I feel like we could probably just repurpose this same thing and uh, and have a go at the current administration. So, uh, but you know, this is part. It was part of an animation series. Uh, a little bit of fun. Humor goes a long way when you can use it appropriately. Mapping and data visualizations, something for the National Association of Manufacturers. This was an internal website rather than external that, that produced one pages that they could take, the lobbyists could take with them up to the hill that showed all of the manufacturers in a particular state or district. Uh, you can do various versions of this economic impact reports that you might have. If you can break it down to the state and district level, it's very, very interesting for the office and for the staff members that you're meeting. And again, very empowering and interesting for the advocates who have it in hand. Talking about white papers, uh, this was something we did for Johnson & Johnson a number of years ago on cosmetics reform. Uh, and that is turning these white papers into a much more visual element. Uh, this white paper got uh, uh, featured on the Senate floor, which was very exciting. Um, but uh, lots of ways for you to think about that and it doesn't have to, it, this is a little more, more illustration style, but you can use other images, you can use other assets, but again, just a different way of thinking about how you deliver some of that policy information. All right, next we're going to talk about action centres. I'm not going to really go through examples here. Uh, all of you probably have an action centre of some kind. Um, you're probably using it for your alerts at the very least, maybe for emails and all of that kind of thing. Uh, I, it, that, I'm going to put that in the basics part. If you don't have that, definitely something to look into. But I, I do want to talk about leveraging advocates. And this is video testimonials, personal letters and depth metrics. And let me show you. I'm not going to play video for you here, but these are just some photos and images from video. I mean, you can see how already compelling it is just from these images. You can imagine what the videos are like. Uh, two, one is at a hearing. One is an example below with the, the Brian in standing with the purple background of a video testimonial style. Uh, there we have a lawmaker standing up at a rally. And at the bottom, we've got video from a fly-in. Uh, and if you can take video footage at your fly-in or capture video testimonials when people are coming in for the fly-in, I know that's gonna be in the future. Or if you're doing a virtual fly-in, if you can do that, uh, it's extremely valuable. You can put it in the can and you can use that for years and years to come. All right. I was talking a little bit before about letter desking. This is what letter desking letters kind of look like. So in this instance, it was power supply vendors and companies supporting a position it's on their letterhead. Uh, it's very uh, customized. These were all done through interviews, written back, et cetera. Really powerful, strongly encouraged. Uh, and then I want to talk to you about depth metrics. And this maybe is a little bit more strategy than, than tactics. So one way to look at your program and your advocates is to value three types of activity. And we often value, mm, I would say, probably two. So we usually value the second two, which is aptitude to engage in an action, so the likelihood that they're going to take the action we want. And then the quality of their action, are they sending a form letter, are they customizing, are they doing a video? It's the third, or we in this case the first, which is the opportunity to engage a stakeholder, stakeholder that we think is very important to become part of that depth metrics. And what do we mean by that? So if I have someone's email address, that's one method. If I get their mobile, that's another. If I now have their work uh, email address, or I, or I start to build a relationship with them so they know me, um, and or I can reach out to them on social media or whatever, you know, or I'm connected with them on, on LinkedIn, however you want to expand those opportunities to engage them. That's really, really important as part of this depth metrics process. Then we kind of move to aptitude and quality. So in this instance, we created a ladder of engagement and some of your action tools. I know um, 
there are some tools out there, Nation Builder, um, I think some of the NGP van tools have points that you can assign to people that are both either visible to the activists or, or the advocates or not visible. And you can assign points for different actions. It might be a form letter, get something basic or signing up or giving you more contact details or joining on the Facebook community. Uh, it might be attending an event, submitting a video. But you'll see here as an example of a program that we built. Um, it was originally built for Microsoft. It's since been adapted for a number of different clients. But you'll see here the different actions they take. So we've got an action, engagement, quality. So connection, this is where the pack becomes relevant if, you're, if you have a pack, um, where they're becoming part of that. And then the multipl multiplier effect, if they're taking lots of three or four level uh, advocate actions. What you're hoping is that when you build this program, uh, you're using it to avoid a common problem, which is always going back to the same advocates, it's kind of going back to the squeaky wheels, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but we're missing some objectively good and some uh, growing advocates uh, who we don't see because we don't interact with them on a daily basis, but they're sitting in the data and I promise you they are. Uh, this was about a, about a community we grew from about 5,000 to almost 95,000 people at its peak but this was really about finding that top several hundred to a thousand people uh, the folks that we can call up uh, on a really a, a moment's notice and get them to take the actions we needed uh, we do things for the microsoft program uh, we have a, a really key level they're not key contacts in that we're trying to get them in every district uh, they're more like board members or voluntary board members, uh, but they get to go out to Redmond uh, near Seattle, uh, which is Microsoft headquarters. Uh, they've had a trip to China, and I know not everybody can do that, but there are things that you can do with your own program. Um, but they've had a way to really feel engaged. Uh, and when we need them for fly-ins and, and for other important uh, elements, uh, they're, they're there for us. Let's look at a little bit at in-person events. Um, really video packages. I'm going to kind of skip in person right now just because it feels a little less relevant. Um, maybe we'll come back to that for a future session. Uh, but I do want to talk a little bit about advertising, the homepage, network, contextual. Uh, networking contextual is where you buy uh, advertising across a network or around keywords, even for display. Um, some paid search and online petitions, which is some recruitment methods that you can think of if you have paid budget. Uh, on advertising, I mean, we all know the basic online advertising features and developments and designs. This is just a, a kind of basic list. Uh, but I also want you to think about things like uh, online petitions. Uh, they change around all the time. There's new ones coming in. Uh, Care2 has been around for years. Uh, Change.org is not uh, doing advocacy stuff anymore, but is available for fundraising type efforts. Uh, and there's elements on the right uh, as well. Uh, the idea here is that you work with the provider to basically set a price for recruiting an advocate and then you put the onus on them to recruit those advocates through their network. Uh, it's not different than a cost per acquisition strategy you would see at a corporate level. Uh, we call it cost per activist. Uh, it's still real people taking real actions. Uh, and then you follow up with those people to move them into your program and to make them part of your network. So it's an interesting idea if you've never tried it. If you have tried it you know, and, you've, and you've seen some results from it, maybe throw that into the chat so others can, can see how that's going. All right, uh, digitizing the grassroots. So email, social media, websites, forums. Okay, that's the basics, we know that. You're pretty much probably engaged in at least three of the four, if not all of the four in your program one way or another. Uh, I know email is gaining, regaining in strength during this time. But how many of you are organizing with a CRM or, or even know what a CRM is, um, which is a constituent relationship management tool uh, or in, the, in the, the normal world, a consumer relationship management tool, a consumer relationship marketing tool, some times it's called. Uh, but this is the next level up on the action center uh, or the, the action tools that you might have. Uh, this is a way of managing and leading your database. Uh, and really that stuff that I talked about earlier in terms of the depth metrics, uh, that's all about trying to, trying to get that information in there, understand 
bring in your interactions, both online and offline if you can. Uh, does it require a hefty investment? It's more expensive than your, than your normal uh, advocacy center, but it's not crazy. And it's definitely worth, it's definitely worth the dollars. Uh, I would highly encourage you if you don't have it in, in part of your program to do it. You can do it on a very, very basic level if you've got a smaller advocacy pool, uh, you know, whether it's an Excel sheet that you're just marking off and identifying, but I would encourage you. In terms of the options, um, I think if you've got a community over a couple of thousand people, uh, it's a must have. Uh, if you're trying to grow a community, it's a must have. I, I would encourage you not to spend money on paid recruitment without having some kind of tool like this. Uh, otherwise, you're, you're, that investment you're making kind of disappears um, because you're not really rebuilding, you're not really thinking about how to create the next level. Uh, and how do I learn to use my tool of choice? I won't answer that question here. I will say that the CRM providers are pretty good uh, and there's lots of information out there. So I'll let you go through that. Again, in the chat, if people have a CRM, a favorite CRM they like, or uh, because we don't sell CRM, so I don't mind, if you have a CRM you have really not enjoyed using, uh, please put that in the chat for other people uh, to see. So that will give them a sense of what you do and don't like. Okay, uh, where is your community? is the key question. Uh, you know, should you be on Instagram? You know, do you go onto TikTok? Uh, if your community is not there, please don't waste your time. And it's okay, it's okay if your community is in LinkedIn, it really is. Uh, that, that's, that's easy. It's great if your community is in, in Facebook or on Twitter or, or moving into Instagram and other places. Um, but you really need to think that through before you engage. Uh, and, you know, figure out what you want your voice to be. It can be different. Uh, and just because you're on something like LinkedIn doesn't mean it needs to be fully professional and have no advocacy voice and no advocacy or emotive elements. Those are still, they still play there, but you have to think of a little bit. Uh, how do you engage with your community? I, I'll let you think through that. And then how does your community engage with you? Again, a more a question for you all to think about for your own programs. Uh, email, social media, best practices. I wanna get off the basics. I'm gonna move through this fairly quickly. Most of you know all of this stuff, tone and voice, a profile setup, um, but do think about things like what's clickable, getting a call to action, um, be better about app mentions, replies and engagement. Uh, it really is a sharing and a, and, a, and a discussion. It's not just broadcast, broadcast, broadcast. If you're not retweeting, if you're not replying, uh, if you're not sharing the love, you're probably not engaging in social in the best way you can. Um, think about your hashtags. Uh, if you don't have a hashtag, it's probably not spreading. That's the basic stuff. The more advanced level is really go and look at the hashtags that you want to get in on that discussion. Uh, and then list hygiene, particularly for email. If nobody, if somebody has not opened a single email from you in a few years, you know, I would say probably even less than that, take them off or put them somewhere else. A, so they don't cost you a heap of money on your CRM because you're often charged by list size but B, so that you really can make sure your emails are getting through, they're not getting blocked by spam. Uh, or to really C, uh, you might have a really valuable advocate who you've just lost contact with or they've changed their details, uh, who you wanna find a way to get back to. That list hygiene process can help a lot. Again, this is a little more basic, so we'll, we'll skip through. This is probably what you're most interested in. We have a good amount of time uh, to talk through this. Uh, on each of these next slide, I'm, we've kind of given you the full paragraph from the article I wrote. I think we're going to share that full article with you. Um, so you don't need to take notes and I promise I won't just read everything that's on screen. I know there's nothing worse than when that happens. Uh, but I wanna talk to you about what we've seen and, and maybe how some of this has changed since this was written. I think it was written back in um, April or May. So. I probably mentioned it three or four times. I'll mention it one more time. Uh, we are definitely seeing a return to email. Again, in the chat, if this is something you've noticed, um, you know, please let us know. All of the um, Action Center tool companies are saying that they have seen their highest volume in email letters to the Hill uh, and, to, and to other uh, policymakers um, that they've ever seen. It, it's just huge. So, you know, match to district constituent emails. That's that's what I'm talking about with the emails to the Hill. It's an absolute resurgence. If you aren't doing it or you feel like it's not, you, you've forgotten about it, please go back to it for the right types of issues. Uh, it, it is going to work. 
Uh, and it's just an easy first action for advocates stuck at home. And remember, they want to help right now. This is another thing that we're finding. Uh, people want to find a way to advocate. Uh, it's, good for, it's good for them and it's good for you, so please do that. Virtual fly-ins. Uh, I don't think there is a single bigger question uh, that we got really from March 15 uh, onwards was the virtual fly-in. Uh, some of our clients, that was the middle of fly-in season, it was cancelled. Uh, some, you know, thought we might be back to it in September and, and we got a rude shock on that, obviously. So, um, what I would say, first of all, is we are not alone in this situation of you not being able to do a fly-in. I mean, there's been many groups, some of you may represent some of those, uh, those patient groups that haven't been able to do fly-ins for years and have had to run successful fly-in events. So the good news is it's not new. Um, the good news is the technology is just so much better uh, and particularly Zoom and others. Um, so go ahead and schedule meetings like you would uh, and, and ask for you know, a conference call or a video chat, however that office is doing it. I will say one of the issues that has come up is that the Hill offices, whether it's the staff, or the member, if you're if you're fortunate enough to get um, a meeting with a member, are not responding, uh, or sorry, are not putting their cameras on. Uh, so you can ask them maybe at the beginning to put their cameras on, but understand Zoom fatigue is a real thing and it's acute for them. Uh, so if they want to turn it off, you know, just explain that to your advocates in advance and and be respectful. But that's sort of why that's happening. Um, virtual trainings set your people up the right way. Uh, give additional opportunities to ask questions, report back on the meetings. Uh, you might want to try a virtual reception. There's a tool called Remo, R-E-M-O dot co, uh, which is a great networking tool. There's other tools that you guys can use uh, that you can do to celebrate and make it feel more like a fine. So you're not alone and these virtual fines are happening and, and are being very successful, often with much, much higher participation rates. Telephone town halls, not new, not new. Uh, you can set these up uh, really easy. I would encourage it. Uh, again, uh, I won't read through this. You're getting the article. Letters to the editor, uh, much like constituent emails, uh, these letters haven't in in more recent years been getting the love. The you know please do that. Uh, you know everything about media consumption. It's it's skyrocketed. Uh, but you have to provide that same talking points and training uh, to get that moving. Uh, social media advocacy challenge like the Ice Bucket Challenge. Uh, make sure you're getting people to really push their involvement, you know, uh, provide hashtags, maybe images, other types of things. Uh, a version of this is you know, branding social media profiles, Giphy stickers, um, you know, just the visual brand, make it feel like it's, it's you know, around and within your community. Uh, that's another way to, to take it online. Again, I hope these are tactics that you keep uh, even after we return to being able to do in-person events, it, it's truly um, an important leg on the stool, you know, if we had to expand that stool onto digital. Uh, online, online resource hubs. Uh, this was something we were asked to develop for clients. Um, I, we, we did more online resource hubs uh, in April and May than I, than I, than I care to admit. I, I, I might, might have a little bit of uh, <laughs> feeling about it now, uh, but really it's about sample social media, talking points, scripts, policy, media, whatever you need, whatever they need to feel comfortable. Uh, if you, you can put it on your own website, it doesn't have to be expensive. Uh, you don't have to build a completely brand new tool, but just one place that they know to go. Password protected, or if you're happy for public, that's fine as well. Uh, virtual trainings and webinars, you're doing it, you're part of this. Uh, that's exactly the right thing to do. Now think about how you can do that for your supporters and advocates. Uh, learning management systems, which are programs where people can walk through. They maybe can take quizzes. You do a guided PowerPoint presentation, anything and everything that you can do to get that content out there. Uh, your advocates are craving it. They need it for the fly-in, the virtual fly-ins. Uh, and then again, it's not lost after this period. You can really use it and keep it going. Uh, virtual site tours and 360 degree videos. Uh, this, this is something again that was from before. 
Um, we can't take members of Congress to a facility, um, particularly if you have a facility that's working on something related to COVID or, or other health crises that have been coming up. You know, this is a really great way to show a lab, show a facility, uh, any of that kind of thing. Uh, I would encourage you, you know, to, to consider a 360 video, which can be easily viewed, or even just standard videos, anything, photos, anything that can help give that context. Letter desking we've talked about, so I won't go back into that here, uh, but again, something that can very easily be done virtual. And then story banking or constituent video testimonials. Uh, if you get one thing from this presentation, if there's one takeaway, let, please let it be this. We want you to capture video testimonials. Uh, it's such an awesome opportunity to do that right now. It's probably a very valuable thing that you can have. Uh, and, and you know, you, there are tools out there like Pipe uh, and some of your, uh, your, act, uh, your advocacy platforms have the ability to capture video. Please use that, try it. Even if the first few aren't any good, you can show examples to your advocates about videos that are good. You can give them talking points. You can ask them questions. There's all different kinds of ways we can make this work really well. Um, and then online grass tops and key contact networks. So this is really um, kind of finding some of your key volunteers and tasking them, you know, and, and making them kind of advocates for you out in the field. Um, they want to be asked. You've got a lot of people who might have some time to be able to do this. Uh, and with anything, the peer-to-peer -peer stuff uh, is just extremely valuable. All right. So we've got about 15 minutes to go. I want to leave a little bit of time for questions. I don't know if there have been any questions up to now. Uh, if not, I'll kind of continue into this next section and just make sure I leave a little bit at the end. But let's talk about Congress and, and specifically the new Congress. So. The basics, you guys all know this congressional culture stuff, or presume that you know it, right? Uh, we know they're not alike. Uh, we know it's a weird work, work, <laughs> workplace and work pace. Uh, we know that staff and the member of Congress time is limited. And we know that the Hill is probably more like high school. Uh, and so understanding this congressional culture uh, and also teaching it to our advocates. Uh, I think they forget sometimes, or they may not know. I think they have a different view of it. They probably have a TV view of it. I think that's really, really important. Hill staffers look like this, although this quite frankly isn't necessarily the most diverse bunch, but you know, they, you know, their average age is 31 years old, right? And they're extremely important and they can come across as young. Uh, they can come across as not as valuable to your advocates as, as meeting the member of Congress. Uh, advocates or Hill staffers are, you know, have stories about advocates who have treated them extremely poorly um, because they're not the member of Congress. But explaining to your advocates that sometimes these staff members in some ways who are more uh, you know, up to the, um, uh, the day to day uh, with what's going on a particular policy issue may be the person you, you want to meet. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about some do's and don'ts in a minute. Members of Congress, you know, we should think about this particularly when we're encouraging people to write letters and, and put things on social and other public forums. They want their constituents to think well of them and they want good local press. They hate surprises, wasted time and most of all bad press that makes them look weak unlikable and vulnerable. This is from the Indivisible Guide. Uh, I'd encourage you to download that and read it. It's a little older now, but, uh, but, uh, but a very helpful and probably very true document. So how do we show you value to, as an advocate? First thing, we need them to know that we're, they need to understand they're competing with everybody, right? So we need to find a hook. We usually suggest a personal story, but not too much of a personal story. Don't, don't get bogged down in it. Be truthful and balanced. It's sad that we have to say this, but but that's we we want those advocates to be there to be truthful and balanced. They're not going. We don't need them to be shilled, you know, and we need them to make that ask really clear. Uh, it is very very common for Hill staffers to note they've noted it in the surveys to the Congressional Management Foundation that they'll have a lovely meeting, uh, and sometimes the advocates themselves have, will say, "I had a wonderful meeting. It was so nice. The member of this or the staff member that." that they never made the ask. So get that up front, make sure they're used to doing it. And then make sure that they're building and cultivating the relationship. It shouldn't be a one and done type thing. Alternatively, 
please tell this to your advocates. And some of you already do, I know. Do not express disappointment if you can't meet with the member directly. Um, please do not overshare on the personal story. These slides are actually slides we use to train advocates who are coming up to the hill. So you're seeing what we tell them directly. Uh, don't get offended if your meeting is quick and please don't forget to make the ask. So again, if you're not already doing this, uh, you know, it's just basic stuff that you can help help your advocates uh, get their message across. And with that, and we've probably got 10 minutes or so for questions. Uh, thank you again. It's hard because I don't, I don't get to see your chat and I don't get to see your lovely faces, but, uh, but I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much, Matthew. That was wonderful. Thank you. Please feel free to enter any questions in the chat box and I will read them as they come up. Um, but I did want to start with just um, one question I was thinking while watching you present is, you know, after the election, um, a lot of times everyone goes up to the Hill and just spends the day meeting new members, going from office to office. Um, and this environment is going to be a little bit different. So I wonder you know, if you have any recommendations on how you can quickly meet many new members of Congress um, in this environment and, you know, different strategies for that. Yeah, it, though it's a really interesting one, and this goes somewhat to this question of how do you introduce yourself to the new Congress. So I'll kind of kind of touch on both of those. So in the instance of the American Society for Microbiology, uh, we've st they've started doing briefings, uh, and maybe a year or two years ago, you know, not that many members of Congress, uh, maybe not that many staff would have turned up to to their briefings, but boy oh boy are they packed now. Uh, they really want to hear from them. They want to be able to ask questions. They want to understand uh, a whole range of things, not just COVID related. Uh, so I would encourage uh, the briefings. Uh, it's a really good way to get some of your higher level members and your better advocates and your experts out there. And you can line them up on a virtual basis. Uh, you can record them as well. Uh, I'd also think about doing a kind of virtual fly-in but that's maybe over a week or two. Uh, sort of early on, uh, maybe in January, uh, in December, if you know who the new members are, um, where, you know, we used to call them drive-ins. So a fly-in is when you come into DC and a drive-in is when you go to the in-district office. So um, kind of like a, a week or two where people are really encouraged to take that higher level action uh, and to tell their story, maybe to send a, a welcome message. Uh, or maybe a thank you message if that if that's relevant, but something a little bit more positive, uh, I think, can be a really really great great way to do it. I would also encourage your organisations to put on the the tele town halls, um, or to just go and ask you know those officers how they would like to meet with with your constituent members, whether it's uh, different bio organisations or whether it's patient action groups. Oh, that's great advice. You also touched on the culture of staff and Congress, and I'm wondering, um, have you seen differences in how perhaps the congressional staff and then a member of Congress are approaching the virtual meetings, uh, if maybe one's more comfortable than the other? Because I'm thinking, you know, as a lot of us are training advocates to go to the Hill, you know, based on who they're meeting with, maybe we need to adapt that training so they're prepared for a variety of formats. Well, yes, yeah, so it's interesting. So there's two things that, that that may be relevant right now. I don't know if it will hold. And that is the, the offices are less staffed. And particularly, uh, there's not interns. There's not a lot of that um, very, very junior level. So in all likelihood, your constituents' letters are going to be processed by a slightly more senior level member of staff. That's really interesting um, because they might have missed a lot of that correspondence. They're going to start to see it more directly. Uh, we are definitely seeing more total meetings happening. I think it's the nature of virtual because you can block more in in, a, in, a, in an hour. Um, so rather than less meetings happening, you're actually seeing more. Again, that's for you to be able to take advantage of. The other thing that we're seeing is that we don't need to have a fly-in necessarily be a set day or even a set week, even though I just recommended that. So you can set them up over a much longer period of time focus on uh, committee members if that's relevant to you or focus on other members or new members whatever it is that you, whoever you're trying to reach uh, we haven't got any statistics yet on whether members of congress are meeting more 
than their staff. So for example, does the virtual format lend itself to members of Congress being on more meetings? But there is some anecdotal evidence that that, that is happening. But we are definitely finding at the district level, the district level staff are loving it. Primarily because I think they're getting a little bit more attention. Uh, they're able to get engaged uh, more. Uh, and there's less of that, oh, we have to talk to the Hill office. Uh, they're playing such a key role. So I think, you know, insofar as you've built relationships with the district staff now, now it's a good opportunity to, to come back to that. No, that's a good reminder to incorporate that as part of your outreach overall and to keep them connected as well. And um, that kind of leads into my next question as well is, you know, moving forward and um, post COVID, I'm wondering, you know, a lot of groups are discussing, well, I kind of want to keep this virtual part of the fly-in, but also have the in-person aspect as well. So I wonder if you have recommendations, you know, going forward, how you would divide that, but maybe it would help with those uh, in-district visits as well, having advocates spread out. Yeah, look, what I would encourage, it's, it's a big question and it comes up in relation to events as well. I know some of you probably put on events and, you know, do you do this sort of semi-virtual? method and you know you don't want to cannibalize your in-person people when we're able to do that again. I think part of it is thinking about maybe different purposes for the in-person versus the virtual. So our in-person might be our traditional coming up to the hill whereas virtual could be part of your drive-in strategy or virtual might be a subset on a very specific issue or alternatively the other way around. Your flying may be very focused on a specific issue because you have something coming up that's relevant and your virtual ones are more throughout the year. Um, and it's okay to have people do both. And I think that's been a little bit of the difference. And it may be appropriate to, you know, maybe in the future, um, because there's something about exclusivity, there's something about making advocates jump through some hoops. And some of you are running advanced programs have probably discovered that if you make it a little bit more difficult for advocates to get involved, not, not stopping them from getting involved, but just you know make them go through certification or training, that you actually end up with more involved, more engaged, uh, better advocates. So what you could do is you might say, hey, we want you to come to this fly-in, particularly if it's a fly-in that your organization helps fund. But before you do that, you have to do a virtual meeting, you know, or you have to do a series of virtual meetings. You have to do a virtual meeting and a video, and that's sort of what qualifies you, trains you to be able to then come to DC and do the Hill meeting. So again, just something to think about and different ways to leverage what is an awful situation. I don't like looking too much at silver linings, although I'm happy to look at silver linings, but, but this is one thing that I do think virtual can become part of your program going forward. I, I love that idea of kind of setting up the almost like an academy or training program and then for you know the following year have them come in person on the hill um, depending on the scenario but no that's I love that idea um, just one last question for you I was going to see you know as we're doing zoom meetings or conference calls uh, with members of congress and their staff um, typically, we're organizing, you know, it could be hundreds of advocates uh, or members. Do you have a recommendation for, you know, how many people you have in a meeting? Um, and this could vary, but I think it'd be helpful to know as we're, you know, looking to plan later this year, how, how many we should have in each meeting and really target that. It's a good question. And I probably my answer could take up half an hour. So I will do the very short version of it because it really depends. And I hate the answer. It depends, but it depends. For a briefing, you know, you really want to have your core experts and then you want to have everybody else there so you can show that you've got a big following. But it's really about about promoting the, the core people and those core voices. For a teletown hall, I think you keep it similar. Uh, you, you know, maybe for a hill visit, you might have had a four or five people at most. You might be able to go up to 20 people uh, as long as you have pre-designated who's going to to sort of talk through and represent the group. Uh, you know what it's like on a Zoom call with 20, 30 people. I mean, if everybody's trying to talk, you're, you're never going to get anywhere. Um, part of that is also talking to the office ahead of time. If it's a, if your group is a group that the member of Congress wants to talk to and wants to be heard, then you might want to think about uh, larger. So for example, um, we do some work with the uh, retirement 
community um, and nursing homes and things like that. It's it's obviously a really horrific what's been going on and very challenging. And a lot of members of Congress want to be able to talk to those types of constituents. So that's when you would look at doing something a little bit larger. Um, it, yeah, it, I, I, I really is. It's probably it's its own topic. So hopefully that's address address your question. But uh, I think using common sense uh, and training the people ahead of time. Uh, and maybe using your moderation abilities to mute people if you need to uh, is okay. No, that's helpful. I think as groups go into these meetings and thinking about, you know, who assigning who's going to be saying what, who's there as a support uh, person. So, no, that's helpful. Uh, well, that is it for today. Um, thank you so much, Matthew. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we hope you have a great rest of the day. Um, Take care. We'll see you in a few weeks. Thank you.